Oh, praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today and good to see all you wonderful people here. Um, John Mark, good job this morning. Worship team, good job. Folks in the top. Everybody did a good job. Give all the support team a good hand. It's good to be here today. I just want you to get your Bibles out and um, prepare for part three that my wife started. Actually, she didn't know if it was going to be a series, but I was so in, stirred by when she ministered a few weeks ago about the message that I, as I, she was preaching, I just began to uh, sense things that I wanted to share. And so last week we shared, I know, about the, some of the beginnings and the process of getting into the promised land of what they uh, had to do and how long it took them just to kind of get there and the, uh, the three-day wait and then going over and the spying the land out and, and then they got to Gilgal and they had to get all the guys had to get circumcised and then they, get to, they go down to Jericho and they march around the city and the walls fall down and they got a problem that happens uh, with a fellow. He takes some stuff that's not his that he's not supposed to take. He's supposed to surrender to the Lord and, and the next battle they go to, they, they lose. Uh, they lose six or eight guys, I think it is, and everybody's in distress. Joshua's all de depressed and stuff and the Lord says, get up and find out what's wrong. What happened? You know, re re what was the reason for the defeat? And they go and begin to find out at, through discovery that there's a, a man that's taken something that, that wasn't his to take. It was the Lord's and they discovered him, they found him out, and his whole family uh, was destroyed because of that. His whole entire family was destroyed because he um, violated the Lord's word to them, which is pretty serious if you think about it. And, um, of course, they, the process of the conquering the promised land goes on. And so I, I ended up with the, a little thought last week about unity and how important unity was and how um, that, that's an absolute that we need to have. And I, I'm not for sure if my wife did it the first week, but she did it some weeks ago. Uh, when we first came to town, we had 15 people. Now, when you have 15 people, it's pretty easy to get 15 people on the same page. Is that true? Are you with me? And then as, as the church grew, we were up to 30 or 40 people and 50 people. We moved out here and we began to have, before we moved out here, we began to have some issues with people because they weren't in unity with what was going on. We bought the property and they were fine about that because we were able to pay for the property completely debt free. Um, but we moved out here, we had to get out of the facility we're in. We were renting the facility and the lease was up and we had to, we just had a few day, a few months actually to get out of that building. So we had to go borrow some money, which we borrowed a small amount, $30,000. And um, the $30,000 um, Borrow money was cheaper than our more than our rental was our rental lease was by about half But somebody came to me and says pastor. I thought I said why are we why are we borrowed money? We're, we're going in debt and I said are you serious? I Said how can we be going in debt? And we are in a rat hole of a place It's never going to be our own we're throwing money in a, a bag with a hole in it And I said plus we're gonna be paying half as much money To have our own place as to rent a shoddy facility now you figure that out. So once I said that, all of a sudden we got unity back. And so we said this, if we have five, we want unity. If we have 15, we want unity. If we have 50, we want unity. However how many people we have, there's one thing you want to always have. You want to have unity. It doesn't matter if it's a husband or wife. you got to have unity. If it's a church body, if it's a group of people, if it's a business, you have to have unity. Everyone has to be in the boat going the same way, doing the same thing. And so we, we're, you know, unity is very important. And we're going to talk about unity a little bit more this morning. But I want to read a story to you about a man that was stranded on a desert island. There was a man who was stranded on a desert island for many, many years. One day, while he was strolling along the beach, he spotted a ship in the far distance. This had never happened in the entire time that he'd been on the island. He was very excited about the chance of being rescued. Immediately, he built a fire on the beach and generated as much smoke as possible, and it worked. Soon, the ship was heading his way. When the ship was close enough to the island, a dinghy, or a small boat, was dispatched to investigate the situation. The man on the island was overjoyed with the chance to be rescued and met his saviors as they landed, or the people who were going to uh, get him back to, the, back to the homeland. After some preliminary conversation, the man in charge asked the man that was on the island how he had survived so many years. The man replied by telling of his exploits for food and how he was able to make a fine house to live in. 
In fact, the man said, you can see my home from here. It's up there on the ridge. And he pointed the men in the direction of where his home was. And they looked up and they saw three buildings. They inquired about the building next to the man's house. And he replied, he said, that's my church. He said, I go there to worship on Sundays. And then the other man asked about the third building. And the man replied, he said, that's where I used to go to church. Make something simple is sometimes it's even hard to get an agreement with yourself. It's hard to have unity with yourself. Sometimes we're conflicted. Sometimes there's things that go on in our hearts and our minds that, that part of us wants to go this way and part wants to go that way. And this man obviously was having this problem. So I guess if he'd have stayed on the island much longer, he probably would have built another church because he didn't like the other church he was in. So unity is something very, very important. And again, our biggest, our biggest enemy when it comes to unity is ourselves. And so the point the Lord was trying to bring to realization for the children of Israel there is that he wanted them to be unified. I mean, they walked around for 40 years. And I believe they weren't just walking, you know, just because of, uh, it was the thing to do or God wanted them to walk around. In fact, they could have made the trip in probably 14 to 20 days, I think is what the, the, uh, the folks of geography say. But because of some things that happened, because they wouldn't agree with the Lord, because they got rebellious, because they were stubborn, because they didn't like the process, because they complained and they murmured, they just kind of like stayed in the same place, wandering around. If you looked at a map, they literally just crossed paths about where they'd been before. But it's always the Lord's desire to have unity. Always wanted unity. And again, we said last week, there's no unity. If there's no unity, there's no blessing. If there's no unity, there's no victory. If there's no unity, you cannot go forward in life. You just can't, not even as an individual or as a group of people together. So I'm going to quickly go back over a few scriptures about unity just so we can kind of get this. And I'm going to go to another part of this particular message. Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3. I love this passage. He says, How wonderful and how pleasant it is when brothers, when people live together in unity. Now, if you are married here today, you know how nice it is to have unity in your home. Now, can I tell you something? Unity doesn't mean there's not conflict sometimes. Unity is what... Unity is what brings the conflict under control. Hello? Unity brings conflict under control. So it doesn't mean you're going to have conflict. You're not going to have a disagreement like you. One's going to like hamburger and one's going to like uh, bologna. Yes, you know, but you come together and maybe you put, some, put the bologna on top of the hamburger and make a special kind of a sandwich. But unity doesn't mean there's not going to be some conflict or going to be some contention. But it means you work through it and you come to a place of agreement. It says where the harmony is as precious as the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard in a pun the border of his robe. The harmony or the unity was as fresh, refreshing as the dew from the Mount of Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. And there, there, there at the place of unity is where God pronounced a blessing, even life forevermore. So we can never walk in the blessing of God unless we are living in unity, in a place of oneness, a place of agreement. Number two is, is that not only the blessing is where unity is, also that's Wherever unity is, that's where the gathering is. When you come together here, you should come together because of the unity of the, of the faith, because of the unity of what the belief system here, the core values here, and the unity of what God is doing in this particular place. So when you come together in unity, let me just show you what happens in the book of Nehemiah. This is a lengthy little read here. It says, all the people gathered themselves together as one man. And they had just come out of Babylonian captivity. So these people were excited about being free from captivity and bondage. And they gathered together as one man. Everybody say one man. He didn't say as a thousand men or ten thousand or six hundred thousand or whatever how many was there. He says as one man they all gathered themselves into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. They wanted to hear the book of the law which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. This is so powerful. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the, listen, he read from the morning until the, until the midday before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book 
of the law. And last week we talked about the book of instructions, the same thing. Don't let the book of instruction depart from you and read it regularly. So it says, from the morning until the noonday, they be heard the word of the Lord. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him was Matthias, and it goes through all these people's names. And verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above the people when he opened it, and all the people stood up. You might have been in services sometime where they get ready to read the Bible and they say, can we all stand for the reading of God's Word? You ever been in a service like that? This is where they get that thought from, the concept. This, the platform, the, the pulpits we have here is where we get this thought from. Right here is where it comes from. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and the people answered, Amen and Amen with the lifting up of their hands. So listen, so can you say Amen and Amen? And can you lift your hands up? Come on. That's what the Bible said they did as they heard the word of the Lord. They said, amen, amen. And they lifted their hands up. Wow. They were agreeing with what was being read. And they were saying yes to what was being read. And they said, we receive what's being read. And it said, the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the, the great God. And they said, amen, and amen. And they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And it gives a bunch of names again. And these people had caused them to understand the law. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. But they all came to hear as one man this powerful book of God's word. And they responded in a powerful way. So when you come together, you should have a sense of, rece of receiving. You should have a sense of honoring God's word whenever it's read, whenever it's proclaimed. So when we gather together, there's a sense of unity. Number three, when we gather together, it should bring us one mind, one heart, and one body. Sometimes the preliminary things that we do, maybe the worship and praise, maybe just some of the announcements, maybe some of the exhortations, the prophecies from last week, the exhortations last week, they do something as well. They bring us to a place of one mind, one heart, and one body. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 says this. There's a writing to the Corinthian church. Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good of comfort, be of one mind. He's talking to a church. A group of people, a block of people says, listen, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. So when we are in unity, it brings us peace of mind. It causes us to be able to live together in love and peace. Number four, when we're in unity, there's something else happens. There's a real outpouring of God's Spirit upon us, and you can sense that when, when unity comes, when we're singing a song, and it kind of brings us to a place of being in unity and focus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with what? One accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared in them cloven tongues like in the fire. It sat upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them earth. So there was an outpouring of God's Spirit as they came together as one. Now it took them ten days to get to that place of unity, so it takes some time. Sometimes we're in prayer meetings on Sunday evenings. Sometimes it's like it takes ten or fifteen minutes for us to kind of all of a sudden kind of meld together, kind of come into a place of unity. And once we hit that particular gear, it's like, man, we're off. But it takes a little time. It takes a little preparation. It takes a little plan. But when we come together and we get to a place of unity, God pours the Spirit up. God begins to move in our hearts. Now, it may be something like this, but it may feel you just feel God speaking to you in a powerful way and say, yes, that's it. And you feel like you were going to stand up inside and scream and yell because, yes, I've entered that place of unity where I agree with what God is saying and something has been happening in my life. And then another one that says and, uh, that when we come to unity, victory comes. Who likes to have victory? You like victory? If you're not experiencing victory, then you might not be in unity. Not only unity with yourself, but unity with what's going on. Unity with how God is speaking. Look at the book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 16. This is about Gideon. We'll go into Gideon's story. But the Lord said unto Gideon, And surely I will be with you, and you shall smite the Midianites as what? Not as an army, but what? As one man. As one man. In other words, you're going to be so unified, so together, you're going to smite the Midianites. There's going to be no problem about it. So when we come together, you know we are, you know we are a small, part of a small army, maybe a battalion or brigade. That's kind of what we are. But when we fight, when we come to worship, when we come together, what are we doing in public? We are fighting a war. So we need to be fighting as one, that we agree in, in one, that we're unified so we can get the victory. And then finally, on this thing about unity, unity will bring attention 
to the church. Now, I don't mean just open door. I just mean to the church in general. I mean God's people, when we get in unity, it brings attention to what God wants to do in the earth. This is very powerful. Turn to the book of John 17, 20. You know, we, we talk about the Lord's Prayer being in, in Matthew 6. Well, that's an instructional prayer. And yes, we call it the Lord's Prayer. But this is really, John 17 is really the Lord's Prayer. If you go and read it, this is really what the Lord prayed for His people. Okay, for His people. John 17. And I'm just going to read a portion of this. Jesus said, Neither pray I for you alone, but for them which shall believe on me through the word, through their word. That they shall be one as you, Father, and in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. Don't you love King James? That the world may believe, listen, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you sent me and loved me as you have loved me. Now that's kind of, kind of uh, all over top of itself. But notice, all be in one, that the world may believe. Be one, as we are one, that the world may know that you have sent me, and that you love them as you love me. So when we are in unity with the Lord, when we're agreeing with Him for things, then the world is going to take notice. I challenge you to read John here. Read just these few verses here again and again and again. He's talking about when you are one, when you are in agreement with Him and you agree with one another, the world will know that He was sent because of the way you act, the way you live, the way you respond to one another. We don't need any more division in the world than is already going on, right? We don't need any more unrest than we already have in the world. We have enough. And I've had people tell me this before. I've talked to people about the Lord. I talk to people all the time about the Lord. And I've heard them say this. They said, listen, if church is the way I grew up, and I said, well, how'd you grow up? What was it like? And they tell me these stories. And this is what they say. Then we don't want any part of church. Because they saw them. And this happened when I first moved to town. There was a church here in town that they had a split. The literally the church split because they couldn't agree on the color of the carpet. Literally. I think one wanted green and the other ones wanted wine color. How ridiculous can one get that you are going to split and divide and separate yourselves because of the color of a carpet that you don't like? What does it matter? It's something to walk on. Come on. What does it matter? It's just some decorative thing that's on the floor. You're not looking at the floor all the time. You're looking at the walls. You're supposed to be looking up. There's probably lots of places, a lot of churches you walk into, you don't even realize what color the carpet is. Because that's not your interest. If the carpet is your interest, then you've lost your sense of unity. And you've lost your sense of sanity. Because it ain't about the carpet. It ain't about the seats. It ain't about the walls. It ain't about the lights or the no lights. And we were talking about smoke and stuff this morning. It ain't about none of that stuff. When we come together, we should be coming together to worship the almighty living God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that died on the cross for us to save us from our sins and to save us from eternal punishment. That is why we should come to church and for no other reason. And then when we come because of that, then he gathers us together as one, and we worship, and our worship becomes a wonderful, sweet incense unto him. Come on. That's why we come to church. Not because we like somebody all the time, but we come to church because of him. And if we come because of him, he'll help us like other people. I'm going to say that again. I said if you come to church and you worship him, he'll help you like the people that you don't like. They don't fit in your particular mold. They don't have the right color hair. They don't have the right kind of clothes. I started dressing down because my kids said, Dad, come on, get with the program. <laughs> so what I have on today is practically my kids dressed me. 
Jason bought me the shoes. I had a lot of compliments about the shoes today. Harrison brought me these pants. They come from Express. What 61-year-old man walks into Express in the mall and buys pants? <laughs> Only when he's got to do a return. So when I do the return, I got to buy the pants. These are the best wearing jeans I've ever had in my life. If you've never been to Express, go to Express and buy you some jeans. Get them on the sale rack, but buy you some jeans. I promise you, you'll love them. The shirt I got, Chad said, wow. I bought the jacket. See, conservative navy blue jacket, okay? My wife bought me this shirt. Chad said, wow, what a throwback or something like that. It's the style. Besides that, it don't wrinkle. It's travel proof. What man doesn't want a travel proof shirt? No irons. No steaming. Wash it. Throw it in the dryer. Hang it up. And it comes out. It looks just the same all the time. You didn't come to church to see what I wear, what I don't wear, to see what kind of sounds. You came to church. You should come to church to worship the Lord. If you see your friends, then fine. But you came to worship Him. You came to pour your heart out to Him. You came to connect with Him. You came to agree with Him. You came to hear what God had to say to you today that's going to get you through the rest of the week. Now listen, I got him a little preachy because I was at a, a black funeral yesterday. And so I want somebody to help me in here, okay? Somebody's got to I said, so we came what? To worship him. We came to hear the word of the Lord. Amen? That's why you're here, right? You're doing a little better. But we, when, we, when we get in one, when we are in agreement, listen, can I tell you something? By, by virtue of you coming here and parking the parking lot, coming in the door, you've already given attention to the public of what you're doing. You realize that? That's simple, isn't it? Just being parked in the parking lot. People seeing you drive in. You're giving attention to the church because there's a gathering. There's a coming together as one. Coming together to hear the word of the Lord. And everything about the wilderness, you probably wonder, how did he get on this? I've been talking about the wilderness, the promised land. The, it's, everything about the wilderness was all about this. It was about bringing them to a place where they could be in unity, where they could have conquest of the land, where they would be on the same page, and that they could defeat the enemy because of the unity, because of the way the enemy saw them coming forth across that water and into that promised land. See, there's, and there's, there's another part of this thing going into the promised land. This is the next step after unity, I believe, the next step. And I want to I just kind of break away from the unity aspect and just kind of talk about this a little bit. The goal was that the unity would help them win b battles in the promised land. But the goal that God had for them was to take the promised land. Now I just want you to remember, <clears throat> before Israel was in captivity, Israel lived in Canaan land. So that's where they originally started. But because of a famine of seven years, after Joseph has already been taken captive because his brother sold him into slavery to Egypt, to Potiphar, they're in need of food. And so they look for food. And the only place they got food anywhere is in Egypt. And guess who's in charge of the food in Egypt? The baby boy. The baby boy. It looked like he made a wrong turn. It looked like things were never going to work out. It took him, I think it was, um, oh, he was like you know, maybe 13 years or so it took, I think, for that to actually come to pass. So they're, they're going to the promised land. So... I want you to understand something. This conquest of the promised land had another point to it. And it took some time for all this to work out. Just think, it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Moses. I'll say that again. It took 40 years, Richard, to get Egypt out of Moses. Moses was born in Egypt, raised in Pharaoh's house. So Egypt is all in him, all through him. So guess what? He has to flee Egypt, and he goes and lives in the desert for 40 years. It took 40 years to get him reconnected to God in the right way to get him back, unified in what God called him to do, and then he goes back. So it took 40 years to get Egypt out of him. Guess what? It took 40 years to get Israel, or get Egypt out of Israel. Same thing, because if you, kept, if you hear, read the stories and all the dialogues, and, and it, says, it says, oh, we want to go back to Egypt because the, we had fish, and we had leeks, and we had onions, we had all this stuff. We had all this stuff. 
And they make out like it was free, but it wasn't because they were slaves. So it really wasn't free, but they said, we had free fish and free leeks and free onions, of which all those things stink. It wasn't free. It was, they were in bondage, but their minds were blinded. Their minds were so much in captivity, and so they talked about going back. And the, and the land that had been built by Canaan for God's people was about five years, 500 years at least in the making because they were in, the, in, prom, they were in Egypt for 400 years. 30 or 70 years. Depends on who you read. Now, so they're, they're across the Jordan River. They got everybody with them. I love the story about the two and a half tribes. They said, listen, it says, you might, you're going to live on that side of the river, but you're going to go fight with us no matter what until we win, then you can go back. So now, so they had, this, they had to, to conquer the land. They've already taken Jericho out. They got to deal with AI. Once they deal with Achan, they can go and defeat AI, and then they just continue to go through and they march through the countryside. Has anyone ever thought or considered to look and find out how long? Now, we know 40 years Moses was in the wilderness. We know 40 years Israel was in the wilderness. We know that Canaan was over 500 years in the making. But do we know how long it took them to take back the promised land for themselves? You might read the story, you might read the Bible, and it might be, I forget how many chapters in the book of Joshua and Judges, but it doesn't seem like a very long time. It took, the, the, the campaign, which is a military term, the campaign was seven years. Seven long years. Seven years it took them to take the land back. Now, Charlie might can remember, how long were we in Vietnam, in the Vietnam War? How long were we there? 14 years, and guess what? We walked out in a tie, at best. At best. 14 years, we didn't conquer anything. We just fought. We had no reward. Except when our soldiers came home, everyone ridiculed them when they came home. Cursed them. We had the Iraq War not too long ago. How many years did that take? Come on, somebody. Seven years. Seven years. Guess what? We pulled out. What's going on now? Fighting again. They lost land. They lost cities. They lost property. They lost everything they'd gained before. You know why? Because you just can't go in and win a war. You have to stay and occupy or else you're going to lose everything that you fought for and you won. The story of Joshua and Caleb and the story of Joshua in the book of Judges is that God didn't just want them to go with through in seven years and beat everybody and then leave. He wanted them to go back into the promised land, win every single battle according to his calling for them, according to the land that was theirs in the first place. He wanted them to occupy that land and to stay there until they died, until their families came along. You might say, what does that got to do with us? Everything. Because going into the promised land is just like you getting saved. Come on, it's just like you getting saved. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. So when God comes into your land, guess what he wants to do? He wants to conquer you. He wants to be ruler of you. He wants to be Lord of you. So, get, so he's fighting for you. He's fighting in you to give you victory. But he just doesn't do that and get a victory in your life and just leave. He doesn't get victory and just leave. It's kind of like, I, I tell the story to people all the time that they're having issues and they kind of fall back into things. The scripture says, there's a man in the Bible that says, he had a devil in him, they cast the devil out. Remember the story? And they cast the devil out and then the devil comes back and he says, you're going to see if this house is in order, if things have been put back in place, and he comes back and the house, nobody's done anything to the house, it's kind of like it's kind of empty. And so it says, that guy that left brought back seven more with him. Remember the story? Bring seven more with him. So now, one plus seven is how many? Say it loud. Eight. So the problem went from being just a one simple, one digit number to an eight times more. Think about it. A person that is on drugs, if they get delivered from drugs... 
And they have a relapse. In other words, they conquer the problem, but they don't possess the thing. They don't, come on, they don't live in the thing. They don't take control of it. They don't, um, and, and they don't fight every day. So you have to keep fighting all the time. This is not just a one-time fight. It's over. You've got to keep the land. The enemy doesn't leave you alone. So, if, come on, he never leaves you alone. I mean, he never leaves. Listen, there is no peace with the enemy. There's only peace with God. So if you get delivered from something, the enemy is going to keep coming back and back and back. And it doesn't matter whether it's drugs. doesn't matter if you've got mental problems. doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you have anger issues. doesn't matter if you have, um, uh, I don't know, you just think of anything you want, you know. Maybe you've got problems with your mouth. I don't know. But, you, but it gets worse. So now, so this thing, one leaves, seven come back, then you've got eight. Right? So now your problem is eight times is worse. Eight times worse. Now, I want you to think with me just for a moment. The same thing happens, that person gets free again. Are you, with, you tracking with me? Now, I'm not a mathematician. I got a mathematician right over here. But those eight leave. And each one of those eight, if the, if the math is correct, if you read the, same, read the same way I do, if each one of those eight leave, and one of, each one brings back how many? Seven? Hello? How many we got, Leanne? Sixty-four! So now your problem's gone from a small one to a small eight to 64 times worse than it was. Have you ever seen a person that goes back on drugs, or goes back on alcohol, and they, they, they're worse than they were the first time? Because some help came to make them worse. So what am I saying? That when we go into the promised land, and when God comes into our life, there's got to be not just a battle, not just a victory, but there's got to be an occupying. Can I say, it's got to be an occupying. Jesus said this in the book of Luke. He said, occupy till I come. Stay here and do business right here, right in this situation until I come. It's the same thing for every one of us in our own lives, that Jesus wants to occupy our life until he comes. Occupy our life till he comes. Why? So that that particular area will not get victory over us again. Does that mean you won't have to fight? No. It means you occupy. When you occupy a place, the enemy still comes to try to take back what you've taken from him. Not mighty quiet. This is what the promised land's all about. This is what the battle was all about. They had to learn not only to conquer, but they had to learn to conquer, engage, and occupy. It's the business. It's the business of the kingdom. It's the business of how God moves in our life. So we're saved. Our land, our life, our mind is saved. Our emotions, our habits. God begins to win all that stuff over. Why? Because he's come, delivered us. But we have to engage the enemy. You only lose when you don't engage the enemy. You only lose when you absolve your strength and your power in the kingdom of God. You only, that's when you lose, when you give up. I tell you, I want you to begin to engage the enemy. Why? So you can conquer the enemy. So that you can occupy the land. As a matter of fact, it says act and fight, allocate and keep, and appeal, which means you keep on possessing it. That you never give up. A great saying when we, play, when we play football and stuff like this, it says, don't you give another inch. That's what the coach says. Don't you, don't you, if you what was it, remember the Titans? He says, don't you give them another inch. Come on. If you give the devil an inch, he will take two or three or four miles. Yeah. As if you think that you're supposed to, oh, I'm supposed to go two miles with the devil. No, you don't go two miles to the devil. You don't give the devil one stinking inch. Because if you give him an inch, he will take everything you got from you. All the, st all the, all the progress you've ever made in your life, he will take it away from you. This is what the promised land's about. It's not just about the, the land flowing the milk and honey. It's just not about the great, wonderful fruit that was there. It's not about the wonderful walled cities and the vineyards that have been planted. It's about going after something, fighting for it, allocating it, and keeping it. I find this is such a big problem. I didn't get to be a, a Christian for f almost 40 years now if I didn't fight. Come on. I had to fight. I had to fight. There's days that I have to fight. There's days I feel like I can't hardly get up because there's so much pressure, but I just keep on fighting. 
There's been days, I can't tell you, there's days and times that runs through my mind, just quit doing this, just quit this preaching thing. Why? Because the pressure is so great. Come on. Yeah. I just know, I'm not quitting, I'm not giving up. It's not worth giving up. I, this is what God called me to do. And it wouldn't matter where I was at. If I was working in the block plant, it would still be the same thing. I'm not quitting what I'm doing because this is where God placed me at. And that's another thing. You've got to be satisfied. You've got to, you've got to stomp the ground down where you live at and be happy right there. Be one right there before God can really give you something else. I'm a little preachy today. I apologize. Let's look at a scripture here. I'm going to just show you about this process. I want you to know the enemy is going to fight you every inch of the stinking way. He's not going to let you rest one moment. He's never going to stop tempting you, tormenting you, trapping you. I don't care. He's never going to leave you alone. So you just as well get in your seat and get ready to fight. Exodus 23. This is important. I want you to know, I want you to remind, it, remind you, it took them seven years to conquer the land. Seven years. The Lord told them it was going to kind of be like this from the beginning. Moses says this in the book of Exodus 23. They hadn't been out of promise. I mean, I had to eat it very long. He says, I mean, the Lord's going to do the fighting for you. You just kind of, kind of let him help you. Let him get in front of you. He said, I'm going to send hornets before you, which are going to drive out the Hittites. I might talk about all the ites, the next part of this. The Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites. From before you, I will, I will but here, verse 20, I will not drive them out from before you. Do we have that on the screen? Exodus 23, 28, 29. Put 29 up. Next one. He said, I will, not drive, I will not drive them out from before you in one year. The Lord warned them. He said, it's not going to be just a one-year deal. <laughs> Sometimes we think we're just going to be presto change bang, you know, like Superman. We're just walking into the phone booth, and out we come. You know, we, or we just drop, go down the elevator, and all we come out, Batman, from Bruce Lee to Batman. I mean, listen, or Bruce Wayne to Batman. It takes some time, people. It takes some time. I mean, you might be fighting something in your life. It takes a little time to get that ground back because it's really rooted in there. I mean, it's really there. It's etched. He said, he said I won't drive them out from, for you in one year. Why? Why not, Lord? Let's just do presto changeo. Let's just boom, bam. He said, nope. He said, not one year. Then he gives a reason why. He says, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against you. By little and little, I will drive them out from before you until you be increased and inherit the land. In other words, until you become strong enough to occupy that space. The worst thing in the world for us is if we get it like that. That's the worst thing. The worst thing we can do for our kids is give them something like that. And believe me, we live in a society, this entitlement society has got all wrapped up in families. Because we give kids everything, and not just something, we give them the best of everything. My dad gave me a car, the first car I got was $900, I think it was, a black and white Ford Galaxy 500, two-door, black top, white bottom. Nice looking car. Had 80 some thousand miles on when I got it. Burned oil just like it was like it was drinking it. Things puff of smoke out the back all the time. It's putting oil in it all the time. But man, it was my car. I paid for it. My dad had better sense than to give me a brand new car. Number one is he couldn't afford it. Number two is he and I couldn't afford it. Number three is him and my mom and myself, we couldn't afford it together. So he just gave me this nine this nine hundred dollar car. Then another guy ran in the ground 80 some thousand miles. Listen, stuff don't last like it does now. You can drive a Honda for two or three hundred thousand miles. But back then, that 351, that 351, and what the Cleveland it was the other one, Robert. The Windsor burn oil like you never seen. I could have my own oil company. 
The next car I got is another used car. I've only ever had two brand new cars in my whole life. And I would never tell anybody to buy a brand new car. Why? Because you drive it off the lot, you drive it off the lot, and guess what? You lose a whole lot of money. Because if you drove it right back, just you did a U-turn, guess what? You lost a lot of money. A lot of money. They ain't going to buy that car back from you. And you show them the bill of sale, this is what I pay for. He said, yeah, but as soon as you drove out of here and there was your name on it, it depreciated. So you know, you know what that means about you? You are a depreciated person. In other words, they didn't appreciate your business. <laughs> Can I tell you something? If you, if you give your daughters brand new stuff, brand new car, top of the line stuff all the time, she's going to get married one day. And unless she marries a millionaire, there ain't no way she's getting a brand new car and all the stuff at Nordstrom's. Ain't gonna happen. She can be shopping at TJ Maxx. Yeah. She might be shopping at Ross's. I mean, it could, they could end up at the Salvation Army. I don't know. But don't, don't treat them to Nordstrom when they gotta, they gotta walk the process. Come on. The Lord didn't give them the whole, the Lord didn't give them everything at one time. He gave them one city at a time. One city at a time. He said, why? Because if I give it all to you one time, he says, he said, the beasts of the field are going to grow up, the, and it's just, it's just going to be a mess. He said, but little by little, I'll drive them out from before you, let, and until you be increased in the hair of the land, and I will set bounds from the Red Sea to the Philistines, from the desert to the river. I will deliver the inhabitants of the land to your hand, and you shall drive them out. In other words, I'm going to give you victory, but not at your rate. Not at your rate. I'm telling you, folks, we have got to get this out of our head. Just because you got a microwave doesn't mean God's got a microwave. Hello? God is not making microwavable Christians. God, it's not going to happen. I love popcorn. I love the old-fashioned way, but if I'm in a hurry, I like the stuff in the bag. You just throw in there and turn it on for two and a half minutes, and bang, you got popcorn. Some of you would like your life to be that way. Some of you like to overcome things that way. It ain't going to happen. Just get over it. Just get in the... So the word from unity is the word process. You can't, you can't get out of the process. And you shall not dwell in the land lest, I make them, make, unless they make you sin against me. And if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare. In other words, he said, listen, if you don't do this the right way, you're going to revert to serving other gods. You're going to be going backwards. He says it again in Deuteronomy 7. Let me read that quickly. I'm trying to get us, trying to finish. It's a, I'm trying to finish. This is, oh, the process. The process. I wrote all this down. I, was, I think I was sharing this with uh, someone at breakfast the other morning. But my wife went to a, everybody turn to Deuteronomy. My wife went to a pottery class the other day. Who's ever been, been to a pottery class? She was amazed. She says, it was so hard. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? You just play with mud. You play with mud as a kid. You made mud pies. You made, you know, you... No, she says, no, it's not. It's not easy. And I begin to think about the potter and the clay in the book of Jeremiah. We're clay, the Bible says. We're clay. And he's the potter. Okay? Say, I'm clay. I'm clay. He's the potter. Say that. Now, those are two radical different positions. <laughs> okay? That, I mean, there's a difference night and day. They're different. The clay is just clay. It just was clay. It's wet, marley clay. The potter is the one that sees something in the clay. Right? So he goes and he digs the clay out and he just brings it into his little potter's house and he puts it over there and all the clay's got different colors and got different textures and he, he puts it all in place like that and it sits over there. Now if the clay could talk, he's like wondering, I wonder when he's going to put me on the wheel. I wonder when it's going to be my turn. Well, you got to know something. In order for the clay to get on the wheel, he's got to grab the clay. I didn't get to go to the class. I'd love to go into the class just for this. I love to watch this stuff. So God comes and you're a piece of clay. And he just goes, ah, 
and grabs you, snatches you up, and throws you up on that potter's wheel. Or throws you on the potter's wheel. Boom, it's on the potter's wheel. He's on the wheel. Just throws him up there. He's on the wheel, and he's just, just thrown down there. Just plow. We didn't rehearse this, okay? You can tell, right? And then he, then he just puts his hand on this, and he, he just begins to kind of, kind of work on a little bit. Some of you, listen, I want to tell you something. Some of you never really been on the wheel. Amen. You're clay. Yeah. You're in the house, but you ain't been on the wheel yet. Yeah. I want to get on the wheel. I want to get on the wheel. No, you don't. Because once you're on the wheel, it's another whole story. Think about it. Think about the worst circular ride you can think of, and you're sitting on that thing, and you can, and it won't stop. Woo, 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 woo. Then he pours some water on him, and then he starts pedaling. He's pedaling slowly. He says, hmm, this ain't too bad. A little shower, hmm? a little movement, a little activity. You can go sit back down. You got to picture this. He's, he's, he's got his hands on him, and he's pedaling that pedal. Well, all of a sudden, he pedals faster. And, he, and all of a sudden, he starts digging his fingers down in there. And all of a sudden, ah! Lord, you're getting too personal. Lord, you're getting into deep places. You're getting the places that are uncomfortable to me. Yeah, thank you. It is uncomfortable. He's just, and he's just, he's just digging. And, and all of a sudden, he takes his hand, and he, I see him do this, and he pushes it back, squashes it back. Ah! He presses it back down, and he pulls it back up. And he presses it down, and he pulls it back up. And then he makes it wide, and he makes it thin. It's like, ooh, it's crazy. And then you're watching, all of a sudden, something beautiful begins to rise up out of his hands after all this water and all this turning and all this, his hands all over it, all in the clay. I want you to know something. The clay can't say anything. The clay has no say in what's going on. The people spectating, watching the clay being, this, whatever this vessel being made, it's like, wow, we can imagine what it's going to be. But, it, but it's just, it's just you know, all of a sudden, it's just real tall, looks like a vase. It's a beautiful vase. It's like probably three foot tall. He sees that vase, it's like, oh man, it's this beautiful vase. And he takes the wire out because they have to have the wire. The wire is there to release it from the bottom of the potter's wheel. I know a little bit about it. Watch this. So he gets the wire and he says, oh, he's going to take this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful vase off the wheel. So he takes the wire out and all of a sudden he goes about this far from the bottom. And he takes that wire and psh, right through there and the other piece falls off, <laughs> crashes. God wasn't making a vase. He was making a bowl. How many times do we misinterpret what God is trying to do in a person or in us? When we think he's doing one thing, he's really doing something else. God is working in your life. It may not be what you want or what you think or what your projections are. He has a goal and a mind and a vision for you. Once you're on the wheel, you're at his mercy. Once you're on the wheel, you're at his forming, his shaping, his molding, his making. The clay had nothing to say about the wheel, about the speed, about God's hands, about the water, lack of. But listen, can I tell you something? Once the vessel is determined that it's going to be a bowl, it's not over yet. He takes the wire again and separates it from the wheel. He takes it ever so carefully and he goes over to this thing called a kiln or an oven. Yeah. He puts it in the oven, slides it in there. It's not, it's not air conditioned. It's hot in the oven. See, the, the, the vessel, no matter what, is a vase or a vase or a bowl or a saucer, doesn't matter. It's got to go from here and a disconnect from the wheel to the oven. Got to go to the oven. How long is it going to stay in the oven? 
until it's done. Until it's baked through and through. So it's done. So guess what, folks? Sometimes you, are, you got off the wheel. You're the piece you're supposed to be. You're in the oven. It's too hot in here. You're screaming. You're yelling. You don't like it. You want to get out. Well, if you want to be the bowl, you got to stay. He's determined how long it's going to take for it to be completely hardened, and he takes it out. Then you know what happens? Inspection. You got to inspect it. Inspect it? It's a bowl. I thought it was a vase, but it's a bowl. I give you it's a bowl. And we got to see if the bowl's got any cracks in it. Look, takes the bowl up and looks at it. Looks pretty good. So, well, if it's, if, it's a, if it's a good bowl, it'll hold water. If you read Jeremiah, he talks about cracked cisterns. He talks about cracked pots. It really does. He's going to see if it holds water. If it holds water, he'll finish the glaze on it and it become the vessel it's supposed to be. But if it doesn't hold water, you know what they do? Breaks it, throws it back in the pile, wets it up again, throws it back in the mess of everything else, and then it might come out again on a later date. Wow. The process, people, sometimes can be repeated more than once if we, as the clay, don't cooperate fully with the Lord. It's the same thing that God was trying to tell Israel here. He says, you're not going to conquer this land. You're not going to do it your way. Let me just quickly read here. Deuteronomy 7, I'm going to try to close here. Deuteronomy 7, 21. And thou shalt not be affrighted for them, for the Lord your God. He tells them again in Deuteronomy the same thing. A mighty God and terrible, and the Lord your God will put out these nations before you little by little. Little by little. That you may not consume them at once, lest the beasts of the field. He says the same thing again, little by little. Turn me to the book of Isaiah, quickly. I just want you to see this little premise here about, about the, the courses, about the action, about the process. The process has got to be carried out. The process cannot be violated. If it is, usually, in a, in like in a childbirth, if the process is violated, more than likely the child is not going to make it. And maybe the mother might not make it if the process is violated. Whom shall you teach knowledge, knowledge verse 9 in the book of Isaiah 28? And whom shall you make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from milk and drawn from the breast. And here it is. For precept must be a pre, precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, and with stammering lips and other tongues, you'll speak to them. Quickly, this. It's like course by course. If you, looked at the, if you look at the brick on the front of the building here, there's courses of brick. There's lines of brick. There's precepts of brick. There's in an order. You don't get the second course until you put the first course down. You don't get the third course until you put the second, and it just keeps going. I never forget this as a little boy. We, we took a train ride from, from our hometown to Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. We do it every, it was every summer. And we would go by this uh, big, tall, tall uh, tower. Actually, it was a smokestack. It was all brick. It's just towering. It's one of the biggest structures around where I lived at. And my dad said, hey. He grabbed me and said, hey, son. He says, how many brick do you think did it take to start that tower. And I'm a little boy. I'm like five or six years old. I said, I said, gosh, dad. I said, I don't know. He looks at me, says, only one. And then he follows that up with this. He says, and son, I'm six. I don't know. He says, son, how many bricks did it take to finish that smokestack? I said, gosh, dad, I don't know. I said, how many, dad? He says, one. You can't start anything without the one. And you can't finish anything without the one. But you've got to have everything that's in between to go with the first and the last. That's line upon line. That's the process. And when we start trying to violate the process, we start trying to get away from the process, then we're invariably we're always going to have problems in our life. Always. So the promised land was about conquering engaging and, and keeping the land, allocating the land, appealing the land. But that was a process. What's, why is this important? Because once we come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, 
we enter into the process. There's a process. And we all got things that God is dealing with in our life. And we would like for it to be gone just like that. But it's not going to happen. It's not. You're saved instantly. You're a new creature instantly. But all the baggage and all the garbage in your life that's been influencing your life your whole life, all those things are kind of residue in your life. And he's going to begin to work in you through the process to help you take your promised land, help you conquer your promised land, engage the enemy in your promised land, and, allow, and help you to possess the promised land. Why? Because he doesn't want you to end up like the man in the scripture that got delivered and failed and ended up 64 times worse than he was. Can we stand to our feet? The process. And you have to be in agreement with the Lord in the process. The process, the process. Think about the process. Everything in life is about process. Can we just bow our heads for a moment? John Mark gave us just a wonderful, wonderful communion thing this morning. He laid it out there about the importance of knowing Christ as your Savior. So we're just going to give this opportunity that you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior and you'd like to make Him your Savior today. We just want you to ask you just to lift your hand up wherever you're at in this room. You just make Christ your Savior today. Anyone in this room? Second thing is, is maybe you haven't been serving Christ. Maybe you have not been following with Jesus the way you should. Maybe you've been doing your own thing and you say, Pastor... I want to get back in the process. I want you, Lord, I want the Lord to help me in my life. I want to begin to take, let the Lord take the land back. And you, that's you this morning. I want you to lift your hand up this morning. You want to, to let, there's one, two, three, four. There's four hands there. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every, every single person that lifted their hands right now. That They said, Lord... I want to enter into this process. Lord, I want you to help me. I want you to work on me, Lord. I want to, I want to fight. I want to engage the enemy. I want to conquer. I want to overcome. And I want to possess the land that, God, you have for me. I want, Lord, you to possess my life, Lord, that I'll be the vessel, be the person that you want me to be. Lord, I ask you to touch each and everyone, enable each and everyone. Let them feel the refreshing of your spirit and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit right now, Lord. Now, Lord, if there's, uh, Lord, for the rest of us, Lord, we just pray, God, that if, if we're maintaining, God, that we'll do more than just maintain, but, God, we can enter into a, 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 um, a, a real, real intense fight, Lord. Just take more land because, Lord, there's more for us if we would only, only go further, only believe you for more, Father. Lord, I pray, God, that we would keep our lives, Lord, keep our lives protected, keep our lives safe, Lord, that we'd be conformed and renewed in the image of, a, of you every single day, Father, that we would overcome the obstacles in our life that have so tormented some of us, Lord. And, God, we just ask you to help us, Lord. And, Lord, when we come back next week, Lord, when we come back tonight, Lord, for prayer, God, we pray that we come in unity, Father, and focus, Father, honoring your word, Father, honoring your word, God, I want to hear something, God, that will radically change our life and challenge us father and we ask all these things in jesus name and everyone said amen amen now quickly we have prayer at six o'clock tonight six o'clock come and pray with us for our youth's going to have something the kids will have something so we see you at six o'clock tonight god bless you give somebody a hug too amen